welcome to this session on climate change, biodiversity, biodiversity loss, and public health. I am Nils Christian Stenset. I'm an evolutionary biologist, um, professor of ecology and evolution at the University of Oslo. Uh, I've been working on a broad spectrum of systems, um, terrestrial, marine, and freshwater. Uh, recently, that is, over the last uh, 20 years or so, I've been working on zoonotic diseases, uh, initially on plague, but more recently on a broad spectrum of other diseases, including uh, COVID-19. Uh, much of my work has been on how climate variation and change are affecting ecological and evolutionary uh, set, uh, processes and patterns. What we are what we are part of now is to collect and synthesize the scientific insight needed to achieve a sustainable development and a sustainable management of biological resources. And may I remind you that all we depend on in daily life uh, comes directly or indirectly from nature. We scientists, we are to bring our insight together so as to inform decision makers about what we know and that they better pay attention to. It is the decision makers who shall make the decision about how to move forward and how to achieve the sustainable development and sustainable management of biological resources. It is a, dec yeah, it is a decision maker that shall make the decision about how to move forward. It is us scientists who shall make sure that they, that is the decision maker, base their decisions on sound scientific knowledge. Far too long or far too often we forget the close interlinkages between climate change and biodiversity loss and public health. By way of introduction to this session, I reflect on the interlinkages between climate change, biodiversity loss, and following my brief remarks, my co-chair, Cristina uh, Romanelli, will extend this, that is the interlinkages between climate change and biodiversity loss that I'm reflecting on, to how this links to public health. That climate change and biodiversity loss far too often is treated as two independent processes is most profoundly demonstrated by the fact that UN established a climate panel as one panel, as well as a biodiversity panel as an other panel, which in now have moved more or less side by side, not really communicating very much. It is great to observe that these two bodies, these two UN bodies, now are producing a joint report discussing exactly what we are talking about here today, interlinkages between climate change and biodiversity loss. This is good, but in my mind, it is too late. As an ecologist, I have, and many other ecologists together with me, have seen these interlinkages uh, between climate change and biodiversity loss very clearly for many years. Climate change affects the ecology of our biota and the ecology of our biota feeds back on climate. And there are many difficult issues here. If you are to mitigate climate change through green ecology, green economy, for instance, biodiversity, might be lost without us really being aware of it. So we better understand these interlinkages. With this brief introductory remarks, it is my great pleasure to introduce my co-chair, Cristina Romanelli. Cristina is an environmental scientist at the World Health Organization, where she works at the science policy interface on biodiversity, climate change, one health, and nature-based solution. So she's an ideal person to really be involved in sharing this session. 
She has 20 years of experience in policy uh, evaluation and development, multi-stakeholder uh, engagement, capacity building, and interdisciplinary research to support public health and sustainable development. Uh, she has a long uh, career uh, doing science, and indeed she's very well suited. She's active within uh, the biodiversity panel. With these introductory remarks, it is my great pleasure, Christina, to give you the floor. The floor is yours, or the screen is yours. <laughs> wow, thank you so much, Niels, for the, for the very generous introduction and for really brilliantly setting the scene for this session on biodiversity, climate change, and uh, public health. And um, especially for reminding us to break across our respective disciplinary silos. It really is a pleasure to, um, to co-moderate this panel of really illustrious panelists with such a wide ranging uh, interdisciplinary expertise. So to kick off our discussion, I would like to begin with a reminder that in the weeks and months ahead, we all have an essential opportunity to raise ambition for the post-2020 global biodiversity framework and at the same time, the sustainable development goals by strengthening evidence-based decision-making, as you were saying, by helping to inform bold, ambitious, and comprehensive targets and smart indicators in line with the 2050 vision to ensure that biodiversity is valued, conserved, restored, and widely, wisely used to safeguard both people and planet moving forward. As you've already made uh, eloquently clear, Niels, we simply cannot safeguard healthy societies on an ailing planet. More than ever, the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic has really brought to the forefront the interconnectedness between people and the natural world, making clear that we, as an international community have largely failed in many ways to adopt a systems approach to climate change and biodiversity conservation. And while there's a narrowing window of opportunity to get things right, there is a greater amount of evidence and stronger imperative than ever to catalyze the political will needed for transformative for transformative change. So to do so, I personally am a very firm believer that more integrated cross-sectoral and inter and transdisciplinary action through a holistic One Health approach will be essential to better preventing, detecting and responding to the common challenges that jointly threaten our health, the stability of our planet, but also our economies and societies as a whole. To paraphrase our Director General, Dr. Tedros in a press briefing with uh, Greta just yesterday, we need innovative evidence-based decision-making to ensure that as much of humanity as possible can also benefit from the science we'll all be discussing in this forum. We know that the COVID-19 pandemic has been devastating, but it will eventually recede. And when it does, we'll still be left with all the other global health challenges that we had before the pandemic broke out that are greatly exacerbated by, by both the biodiversity and climate crisis. So, you know, as we know, COVID-19 has now killed over 3 million people, which is a startling figure, isn't it? But even though it does not make the same headlines as COVID-19 these days, it's equally starting, startling in my mind that air pollution alone in the, the, that imperils our biodiversity and ecosystems also kills over double that number of people, causing over 7 million deaths every single year. At the same time, unhealthy diets that are on the dramatic rise due to unsustainable production and consumption patterns lead to over 10 million premature adult deaths every year. And climate change is set to kill an additional quarter million people annually by 2050 under business as usual scenarios, not to mention the enormous toll to food security, to nutrition, to mental health that are greatly exacerbated by these anthrop anthropogenic drivers. Overall, one in every four 
one in every four premature deaths can be avoided, can be avoided by tackling preve preventable environmental drivers. Yet, even after the COVID-19 pandemic broke out, we are hard pressed as a society to demonstrate that we are internalizing that reality. Yet, the health argument for evidence-based decision-making for a healthy and green recovery and to prevent future disease outbreaks is clearer than ever. Among several other reports that I'm sure we'll be presenting here today, um, the uh, last year's IPBES report on biodiversity and pandemic provides numerous examples of an essential bottom line. The very same unsustainable choices that are devastating our planet are also threatening and killing millions of people, not in future, but right now. You know, in the words of Dr. Tedros, there is no vaccine for biodiversity loss or for climate change, but we do have evidence-based solutions. Last year, uh, WHO very briefly published a manifesto for a healthy and green recovery with over 80 tangible actionable entry points for a healthy and green recovery, calling on governments to protect biodiversity and nature, to support clean energy sources, to develop sustainable food systems in healthier cities and reduce pollu pollution to achieve net zero. The post-2020 global biodiversity framework is therefore, in my mind, an essential opportunity to embed these entry points in evidence-based decision-making to restore healthy and resilient economies and societies, and more broadly, the social and ecological resilience that continues to be eroded by human activity. I really do hope that the discussion in this session today helps us to identify essential opportunities to ensure that governments are able to align their policies and investments for a healthy and green recovery, to prevent the next disease outbreak, and by tackling the underlying drivers of both infectious and non-communicable disease emergence through robust targets and indicators. We'll probably get through uh, some of the examples in the discussion. And for now, without further ado, I give the floor back to you, Niels, to introduce our speakers for this session and look forward to the examples, key messages, and solutions you will all bring to the table today. Thanks so much. Thank you very much, Christina, for these words. Um, uh, now it's my great pleasure to uh, introduce Paula uh, Priest, um, she's a biologist um, with a PhD uh, from um, ecology and uh, the in ecology uh, and the department of ecology at the University of Sao Paulo. Uh, she works uh, with the effect of landscape structure on human health, more specifically investigating how habitat loss and fragmentation, land use changes and diversity loss affect the transmission risk of zoonotic diseases. Her main research uh, fo uh, focuses are related to how landscape structure affect the transmission risk and occurrence of zoonotic diseases. She is currently working in WHO uh, as a technical advisor, working on the health state development of and other, uh, working on COVID and other zoonotic diseases. Sorry about uh, being a bit, uh, you know, rugged here. It is a great pleasure to give the floor or the screen to Paula. The floor is yours, Paula. Today, I don't want to talk about the relationship between biodiversity laws and zoonotic diseases because I think this is well established, but I want to talk about how we can try to plan landscapes so that they have a low transmission risk for zoonotic diseases. And I'll do that by giving two examples from our studies in Brazil, one with yellow fever virus and one with hantavirus. And they were both done in a landscape ecology perspective. So we know that the landscape structure is a good driver to predict the biodiversity loss. So it's a good driver to predict the abundance and the presence of the 
uh, disease hosts and vectors. So we can use a landscape ecology approach to try to understand what would be a landscape with a low transmission risk for zoonotic diseases. So in the yellow fever virus example, our main goal was to understand how the virus was moving through the landscape of the state of Sao Paulo. During 2016 and 2018, the Sao Paulo state faced one of the worst outbreaks of this disease, with several human deaths and thousands of lost monkeys. And by knowing through where the virus can move and at what speed, we can know where the virus might arrive and when. In that way, we can be in advance and try to organize vaccination campaigns and try to say to, to save some humans' lives. And we can also know if some deforestation or restoration action is going to create a landscape that facilitates or restrain the movement of the virus. And in, in that way, we can also be in advance and try to create some preventive measures. So I'm not entering any details in here, but by using the presence of the virus in the monkeys found dead by the state, we saw that during this outbreak, the virus was moving on average 1.4 kilometers per day, but it could also move distance up to seven kilometers in one day. We also saw that this virus moves faster in the summer than in the other seasons of the year and that this movement was happening mainly by large roads that cut forest areas, so forest roads, and in second, by forest edge areas that have 100 meters of width and that are close to crop fields. So these two landscape features, they are acting as corridors and are facilitating the spread of the yellow fever through the state of Sao Paulo and probably in tropical areas. We also saw that large blocks of forest can restrain the movement of the virus and can protect both the people and the monkeys that live nearby. So, with our results, we arrived at this figure that summarizes what would be a landscape with a low transmission risk and with a high transmission risk for this disease. So a low risk landscape would have segregated land uses and a non-fragmented forest area, while the high risk landscape would have highly fragmented forested areas with a high amount of forest edges and a highly mixed land use. So for this disease, the landscape configuration is really important. And we really need to think to that before we do any restoration or deforestation action. In our second example with hantavirus, which is a virus that is transmitted in the Atlantic forest of Brazil by these two rodents, the Necromis lazius and the Oligorizomis nigripis. Our main goal was to understand how the landscape structure would affect the abundance of these species and if a nature-based solution, in the case, the forest restoration of the entire biome of the entire Atlantic forest could reduce this abundance. So, after testing for several landscape metrics and in several models with both uh, composition and configuration metrics, we saw that for both species, for both rodents, only the amount of forest cover was important. And higher the amount of forest cover, lower their abundance. So for this disease, it seems that deforestation is the most important driver. To do the second part, the nature-based solution, first we extrapolated the abundance of both species to the entire Atlantic forest. Then we create a forest restoration scenario in which we increase the amount of forest cover for the entire Atlantic forest. So in Brazil, we have a forest code 
but in order to be in compliance, we need to restore almost 6 million hectares of forest areas. So in this scenario, we just considered that our forest code was respected. We didn't care about the configuration of these new forest patches. And we just increased this amount of forest cover of the entire biome in order to our forest code to achieve its legal requirements. And then we saw how the abundance of these species would be in this new forest situation. And then we created a map with the, the, the differences in the abundances of both species. And we saw that for the Necromis lasiurus, almost 44% of the entire biome would present decreases in its abundance, which are all these parts in pink in this map. And we also saw that in some parts, which are these dark pink parts in this map, this decrease could reach almost 44%. For the other species, we did the same thing, and I call you to, to this number, so in the current forest condition, the abundance of the oligorhizomus nigripis is the maximum abundance, is 95 individuals in some parts of the Atlantic forest. But after the restoration, it passes to be 10 individuals. So for this species, almost 50% of the entire Atlantic forest presented decreases in its abundance which are all these parts in, in red in the map. And in some parts, this decrease is huge, is almost 98%. So we can see that by restoring the Atlantic forest, we can decrease the abundance of both species in almost half percent of the biome. And probably we can decrease the transmission risk of this disease because higher the abundance of these rodents, higher the chance of a person to get infected. However, with this bold, both examples shows to me is that it's not that simple. Forest restoration is not enough to decrease the transmission risk of zoonotic diseases. I need to know how to do it. And we know almost nothing about this. What we know, at least for Brazil, is that if I need to restore a landscape today, the best thing to do is to restore in a way that I increase the size of the forest fragments that already exist in that landscape. Because in that way, I can create landscapes that will have a low transmission risk for both hantavirus and yellow fever virus. However, if I, cannot do in that way. And I need to create these corridors and I need to increase this connectivity of the landscape. The best way to do is to create corridors with a width larger than 150 meters. So in that way, I will not increase the dispersion, the spread of the yellow fever virus. And I can also, try to create a landscape that is good for both diseases. So what is, we know until now is that, in fact, these uh, protected areas can stop the spread of, of, of zoonotic diseases. Forest, the uh, forest restoration can decrease the transmission risk of zoonotic diseases, but it depends in the way it's done. And is more complicated than that. We think that it also depends on the context, on the landscape context, in the way in which the landscape is inserted. So it's not only the way you're going to do this, this restoration, but also the amount of forest cover that this landscape is inserted. So we need to better understand what are these three shows that are affecting this disease transmission. And maybe below these three shows, the configuration is really important, but above these three shows, the configuration is not that important anymore. So in, 
we really need to understand all of that aspects before we can really say what is a good landscape for as many as diseases as possible. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Paula, for um, this contribution. Now it is my great pleasure to introduce uh, and welcome to the board for the podium, um, Doreen uh, Robinson. Uh, Doreen is a conservation ecologist by training with over 25 years of experience. She is the chief of wildlife department of wildlife work at the UNEP based in Nairobi, Kenya, where she is also a focal point uh, for UNEP's One Health work. Prior to joining uh, the UN team, Doreen served uh, as the regional chief of environment with the uh, United States Agency for, in for International Development in Pretoria, South Africa, managing integrated biodiversity, climate, energy, and water programs in 15 countries. She began her career uh, working with rural communities in Morocco. Uh, she also master degree uh, from the University of Maryland and a batch uh, BS from Cornell University. It's a great pleasure to welcome you to the floor and the, the screen, I believe it is. Doreen. Thank you so much. So I'll jump right in. The science is clear. There's an indivisible link between environmental degradation and increased human and animal health risks. For the next few minutes, um, I'll talk about how investments in science and evidence can improve policy to reduce risks from zoonotic disease and perhaps prevent the next pandemic. So I'll start, there's a lot that we, do, that we know. Evidence tells us that the loss of biodiversity can exacerbate the spread of infectious disease, particularly vector-borne diseases transmitting through rodents and mosquitoes like the hunter virus that Paula just spoke about. Science also shows us that areas richer in native species can mitigate the transmission of diseases to humans for some diseases, like West Nile virus, Lyme disease, and some hemorrhagic fevers. Emergent evidence indicates that fragmented habitats may stimulate more rapid evolutionary processes and diversification of diseases. And we know that some pathogens are extremely sensitive to rainfall and temperature. Climate change has the potential to fundamentally change the current mapping of infectious disease on this planet. And the last thing that we know for sure, we know that humanity has a consumption problem. As one of the co-authors of UNEP's report, Preventing the Next Pandemic, we identified seven major anthropogenic drivers of pandemic risk, including the overconsumption of wildlife. But we also identified another major consumption problem driving up our risks, the demand for domesticated meat produced in intensive agricultural systems. We know that at least 25% of all emerging infectious diseases, half of the zoonotic ones, have been linked to intensified agricultural systems since 1940. In fact, our analysis showed that the most recent zoonotic pandemics have been associated with domesticated animals, even for those that originated in wildlife. On the flip side, there's a lot that we don't know. We've already heard some of that. It's clear that the issues of infectious diseases and the links with biodiversity and nature are not simple. We lack a full understanding of the ecological factors contributing to emergence and spread of many diseases. Science on the temporal and spatial aspects of risk tied to human interactions within nature and with nature's products are needed. More analysis of the social and cultural dimensions of human nature interactions and zoonotic pathogens is warranted. We need to know how the potential movement of people in response to climate threats, human climate migration, will affect pathways for disease emergence and spread. And of course, our understanding of zoonotic risks is tied to science and data we have for a, very, for a limited number of zoonotic diseases that we know about those that we've studied. COVID-19 showed us that pandemic risk comes from the ones we don't know about. Which leads me to my first takeaway point, we need to invest more in environmental science and have a more nuanced and detailed understanding of risk. This requires cooperation across diverse fields of expertise that Christina alluded to, bringing human, animal, and environmental dimensions together. But that also means we have to design and do the science together in many cases. The One Health approach is an appropriate way to take a more systemic and holistic view of interrelated health risks. 
And while the One Health concept has been around for some time, as has its sister concepts of planetary health and eco health, the focus on environmental dimensions in One Health has uh, lagged significantly behind. So that's my second major point. This has to change. Environmental health is utterly foundational for human health and well being, it's essential for avoiding the next pandemic. Strength in science is critical, but breaking down entrenched institutional barriers to collaboration across ministries, across sectors, and across society is non-negotiable in the solution set. This isn't easy. Each sector has its own frameworks, its own language, its own ways of approaching a problem, and its own goals. And this is where system science has an edge. First, system science is an ideal approach to understanding dynamic relationships between social, economic, ecological, and other relevant dimensions of zoonotic disease. Systems approaches are explicit about linkages and temporal and spatial feedback loops, and they can help us identify more appropriate policy responses. Second, systems approaches supports mainstreaming objectives. It identifies synergies and trade-offs across sectors that can be negotiated in an inclusive process. Third, systems approaches can help identify and avoid unintended consequences of policy decisions. So there's been a lot of talk about the role of wildlife and wildlife trade in zoonotic disease risk in particular. The reality is that millions of people around the world depend on that trade to support themselves. It is also a significant driver of economic development in many countries, providing jobs and income while providing conservation incentives. In 2018 alone, the total global value of biodiversity-based exports was estimated at 864 billion US dollars. We know from past pandemics, such as the Ebola outbreak in West Africa over a few years ago, that widespread bans in wildlife trade were not only ineffective, but they drove the trade underground, further exacerbating risk factors. So is all this trade I'm talking about legal and sustainable? No. Are there zoonotic risks involved? Yes. Um, but by taking a cross-disciplinary systems approach to science and policy, we can develop appropriate responses and avoid unintended consequences. And that includes consequences that can make poor and vulnerable people even more poor and more vulnerable. So my third point is that we can, my third point is that we can bring more indigenous knowledge into integrated systemic approaches to health. So last night I was privileged to listen to a powerful woman, Hindu Omara Ibrahim, who leads indigenous people initiatives in Chad. She talked about how indigenous people don't understand land for climate. They don't understand land for biodiversity. They understand land. She talked about how they were able to move their livestock and that they were responding to cues from wildlife, from ancestral knowledge and other environmental cues to avoid disease. And this is what really got me. She talked about how indigenous people are ready to help build capacity in the rest of the world to take on these issues. I think we need to take her up on our offer. So my fourth point is that I think Christina alluded to this too. We have to attack the root causes behind increasing infectious disease and health risks, particularly the destruction of nature. And even further, we need to unpack the incentives in our social and economic systems that drive that destruction. A key place to start, transforming global food systems. 130 million people are at risk of backsliding into poverty because of this pandemic. We need to support biodiversity enhancing agroecological approaches to food production as a way to meet global food security needs. And we need to support more varied diets that work with nature's biodiversity. We need to make food systems more nature positive and science can show us the way. Strengthen targets for enhancing biodiversity in farming systems to consumer incentives to purchase nature positive food, to rewarding companies that support biodiversity supportive food value chains are needed. And all of this, all of these partnerships will help us achieve an ambitious post 2020 global biodiversity framework. We know the costs of the pandemic are enormous and we also know they're gonna ripple for many years to come. Yet the benefits of biodiversity and, the, and nature continue to remain largely invisible in economic decision-making. So my last point, is about strengthening the science that allows us to account for the role of nature in our well-being. Science and evidence to do the necessary full cost accounting of our decisions. The full cost accounting of degrading natural capital and how it's driving up pandemic and other health risks. In the build-up to COP15, we hear a lot about ambition. 
Ambitious target setting is fantastic, but ambitious action is what we need. So now is the time to strengthen the science foundation to inform those targets, to drive that action, and to provide the evidence we need to hold ourselves accountable across the planet. If we do not invest in this right now, we'll find ourselves continually chasing the next, pandem the next pandemic. If we do invest in this now, we'll find a way to secure our planet, our prosperity, and our well-being. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Doreen. Uh, now it is my great pleasure to uh, give the floor to the last panelist, uh, Lily Ridri-Gusi. Uh, she is an ecologist being based in Peru with extensive experience in nature conservation, uh, sustainable development, and research in topics related to the conservation of biological diversity. Uh, she has been working on the design of national and international policies and projects on biodiversity conservation and climate change related mostly to forest conservation, including Amazonas region. She's the founder and director of institutional development uh, at the Center for uh, Conservation in Peru. Uh, the floor is yours. It's a great pleasure to give the floor or the screen to you. Lily. I would like to talk a little bit about this relationship with um, nature, uh, human well being, and health. I think that all the presenters already have been talking about zoonosis. And um, I have um, some messages here about the, the signals we already had before having this pandemic on some pandemics for other organisms in nature, like the fungus that was infected frog, that is since, since the late 80s, and that has made disappear species like in the top of the mountains in the middle of a national park in southern east Peru. And um, COVID is very likely to have a zoonotic origin. And um, we know that um, health is one of the natural contributions to people, has been recognized as one known material contribution, but is not very much um, connected to all of this. So we really need to work a lot on, on this connection with climate change and public health. So in IUBS, the International Union of Biological Sciences, uh, we have this program that Zibin is conducting for a number of years now, but there are also other contributions that have been made in terms of education. So for mainstreaming all of these three topics, um, I, we believe that education is a very important um, supportive um, strategy because sharing global stories, it will help to make us understand. I, I think that with COVID-19, we all have learned that we are one species that we share so much with nature and that can affect all, always our lifestyles, the well-being, the economy, and our behavior. So it, it is a uh, paramount importance. And um, there, there is another example of how we have been trying in IUBS to tackle this issue on information and sharing information and education at a higher level, more at the university level with this uh, Tropixu uh, program that was developed uh, in the last uh, few years. Um, we also have been conducting this, uh, developing this forum with uh, the secretariat and of the convention and other institution. And in, in our um, conclusions of those or messages coming out, it was clear that uh, understanding and monitoring the ways in which biodiversity changes affect the rent constituent of human well-being in the short and long term is of paramount importance. So looking at all these um, short and long term um, monitoring, it, it's also something that we need to do. 
uh, biodiversity is a public good and it, it is very important for our demands and, and benefits we need from nature. For instance, a large part of tourist activities depend on healthy ecosystems and many important functions in forests that rely on a healthy, diverse flora and fauna are inhibiting when we lose species. Also, it is important to remember that science has already produced many information, but we need additional work to better understand how biodiversity contributes to human well-being um, at large. In the, four, in, the, in the past science forum that we have in 2018, uh, we were already talking about the post-2020 agenda and how to bend the curve of biodiversity laws. And there it was recognized the need for ma massive and robust efforts for transformational changes across all levels of society to support health and better life for human well-being. And um, two concepts, one that has already been touched, uh, it's nature-based solutions that has to be infused in all the actions for the post-2020 biodiversity framework because it, it can be transversal to human health, livelihood, and improve biodiversity and uh, combat uh, climate change. And then the use of ecosystem-based approach as the just uh, Paula has presented on climate change adaptation and disaster risk uh, reduction, it's also very important that we have just seen for health and livelihoods. And there is also uh, more scientific research needed on the consequences of degradation for human health and well being, and also the inefficiency of agricultural systems, social and political scenarios for restoration or these nature based solutions. Now I, I want to touch very briefly some of the targets that have been proposed or that are already in the new framework. And um, like uh, the, the goal uh, for 2050 on how to improve or increase um, supporting healthy and resilient populations uh, on area and connectivity of natural ecosystems. This is not, um, there are not very many indicators. Um, we do have SDG 14 on the marine realm that can be helpful. And I, I, I really believe that we should encourage this uh, mainstreaming with SDG because um, that, that will help to, um, to work better on the human well being altogether. And in the action targets proposed for the global biodiversity framework, target four talks about harvesting and use of wild species in sustainable levels and safely. But how do we monitor that? Um, who should do it? Management authorities, local and indigenous people. There are some hints in SDG 15, 7.1 that we can probably use, but this is not, not really looking at the safe part of this target. Then target six talks about reducing pollution to levels that are not harm, harmful to biodiversity. And um, who should do it? I think that states, private business, consumers, consumers, which is everyone, it's very important and we need to tackle this um, public and establish thresholds and monitor nationally this, uh, this uh, uh, reduction. There is an SDG 12.4, but this one talks about having by 2020, so we already passed the year, to share information on, on the impacts of pollutants on human health and environment or nature. 
So my question is, do we really did that? Can we count on this SDG? How do we um, work together to improve this and to enact this? Target seven says that by 2030, increase contributions to climate change mitigation, adaptation and disaster risk reduction from nature-based solutions and ecosystem-based approaches, ensuring resilience and minimizing any negative impacts on biodiversity. However, this will be very hard to monitor. Um, so for indicators, we could propose this number of nature-based solutions with positive impacts, including on health and livelihoods, but uh, we don't have a true good indicator for this target. Uh, on meeting people's needs, target eight, is, it's a very, very hard uh, target we have written. By 2030, ensure benefits, including nutrition, food security, livelihoods, health, and well being for people, especially for the most vulnerable through sustainable management of wild species of fauna and flora. So, this is a very complex target, and um, maybe SDG 12.8 could help which says that raising awareness on the relationship within sustainable development, lifestyles and, and nature, is something that we can work on to, to tackle this target. Target 11 says that by 2030, increased benefits from biodiversity and green or blue spaces for human health and well-being, including the proportion of people with access to such spaces, especially in urban areas. That's uh, something that can be done and implemented, and it's up to states and local government. Um, tools and solutions for implementation and mainstreaming, Target 16 says that by 2030, we should establish and implement measures to prevent, manage, or control potential adverse impacts of biotechnology on biodiversity, well, this is something that uh, has some background also on, on the Cartagena protocol maybe, and um, should be embedded in the nature, in the national biodiversity strategies and action plans. Now on the final recommendations, um, I have that for mainstreaming biodiversity, climate change, and global health, it is very important to promote behavioral changes, behavioral changes, and also combine global policies. So synergies between climate change, biodiversity, SDG. One way will be through education with a bottom-up approach, cross-generational and culturally sensitive. Storytelling, converting research, well, science informed, evidence based um, research into the larger public, embracing traditional knowledge also will increase awareness of the oneness of our world and humanity and the interlinkages of our health with air health, biodiversity, and climate change. At the higher level, at the national, regional, and international level, Collaborative research on the observed changes in nature due to climate change might inform policymakers to prevent new pandemics. At the government levels, mainstreaming those three subjects should be explicit in national biodiversity strategies and monitor to all related strategies like NDC and SDGs. Understanding and monitoring the ways in which Biodiversity changes affect different constituents of human well being in the short and long term is of paramount importance. For scientists, it is important to keep in mind collaboration, technology transfer, capacity building, and translation of these global issues. We should take into account this SDG that can be very helpful for um, transversal purpose use nature-based solutions and ecosystem approaches when implementing mainstreaming and be inclusive with all sectors 
and groups in society at implementing global biodiversity framework and strategies at it is of a global uh, important and it is a global challenge. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Lily. Uh, thank you very much to all the uh, panelists here. Uh, we have now uh, 25 minutes uh, for uh, general discussion, and I'm pleased to uh, introduce back uh, into the uh, uh, chair position, uh, uh, Cristina. The floor is yours, Cristina. Uh, thank you so, so much. Actually, the floor is not mine. The floor will be for panelists because this is the opportunity uh, to elaborate on the extremely engaging discussions and points you that are, they have. You are all... quite right, but you are going to right. orchestrate that. <laughs> be, the conductor, be the conductor. Okay, well, I'll do my best. But to begin, uh, maybe I'll start with a couple of housekeeping issues, just so everybody's on the same page. Um, with regard to the q and I'm sure everybody has a lot of questions um, and a lot of very stimulating comments. Uh, so I just a quick reminder that the there's a Q&A tab at the very bottom of your screen that should be used to submit your questions. So please don't use the general chat box to submit your questions, but really um, that Q&A tab. And, um, uh, and, and there, there's no real need for attendees to, to, to use the chat tab. We also uh, want to start with a, a word of warning. There is so much rich discussion. There are so many points that have been raised by, by each of our panelists here today um, that I'm sure we're all super keen to really delve into, but uh, it's also important to manage expectations. We only have about 25 minutes as Niels just mentioned. So, um, and, and it may not be possible to get into all of the details of the, of the Q and A. However, I do want to remind you that uh, it will be possible to continue this dialogue beyond, uh, beyond what we have here today. So um, the 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 so so you'll be able to submit your questions and please correct me if I'm wrong here I will I will uh, bring in my my colleagues and, and my co-chair if I if I um, if I got this wrong but um, it's my understanding that the all of your questions are being recorded and. Um, and we are taking them all on board, taking them all into account, and the unanswered questions will then be reposted on the forum's website. So there really is a mechanism to continue this, this dialogue going. And now to kick us off, um, maybe there are a few questions amongst the panelists before coming to the questions that we have from the audience. I'm just wondering, you've heard all of your colleagues' presentations, you know this thematic area very, very well. Are there any questions that you would like to pose to your fellow co-panelists before we get into the questions that have been posed by, uh, by the audience? So if you do maybe to help me out so that I know who is um, who wishes to <laughs> to uh, pose and answer a question. Please raise the 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 hand at the very bottom of the screen. Ah, brilliant! I see Paula already has a. I see Paula already has a question. Please, Paula. Okay, it's for all of you. We are talking a, a lot about these targets, and I think they are really good, but how do we do with these targets when we have this government change, this, this political situation when it was good and then it changed, like here in Brazil. We had a very good government that was very good in stopping the forestation, and suddenly we have this government that doesn't care about environmental stuff and is not learning anything with COVID. And we are seeing, in fact, that the Amazon deforestation is increasing, even with all the warnings that everyone is saying about the relationship between environment and pandemic. So 
okay, they can uh, sign the targets, but is there any chance to uh, put some, I don't know, a thread restriction, something more, more, I don't know, more something to to try to say to that government that they really need to respect the or, or try at least because they are going to suffer some economical impact if they don't. All right, that's a brilliant question, Paula. Um, and I will bring it back to you at the end after other <laughs> after other co-panelists have sought to respond to the question. Um, so maybe uh, just to kick it off, uh, one could say that raising the public public consciousness of the importance of the issue could be one initial way forward. But I would love to hear from all of the panelists and maybe beginning with Lily. Uh, thank you. I, I agree with you, Christina, that um, we need to, to use the, the, the public, the large uh, participation, but uh, it has been discussed and there, there have been some discussions within the UN uh, war, I think, that um, some uh, ways, how do we really ensure that uh, countries comply with all these commitments? This is something that has been discussed and uh, there is no agreement yet. It will be uh, like, uh, I don't know if sanctions, but some way of encouragement incentives for countries really to comply and not only report on what they do or they don't on, on these targets, as we did in the past for the, for the Aichi targets, but also have something more, um, I don't know how to say this, but uh, I guess you understand what I'm meaning. Yes, absolutely, Lily. Thank you for stressing the uh, the importance of regulatory and compliance mechanisms. I would like to also extend the question to other fellow co-panelists. Uh, Zibin, Doreen, please go ahead. We're still figuring out Zoom after all this time. Um, so, um, so a couple of thoughts. First is, first thing we got to do is take this out of the environment sector. I don't mean give it away. Environment sector, science is a critical for the targets, but the solutions, the action achieving those targets, it's about the power of the purse. It's about the power of personal choice. It's about these political decisions of how society is going to develop. We do a great job talking to ourselves in the environment sector. We don't do such a good job translating our targets into what matters in these other sectors. So I think that's the first thing. Um, and that's where the active citizenry and mobilizing youth, this is their future, right? That we're playing with. And so how do we do that? But we've got to be able to translate this science in ways that are relevant for these different audiences. And what's exciting is actually we're seeing a momentum of private sector business. I mean, if there's any silver lining in COVID is that people of other sectors, others like, wow, this is connected, we've got to work together. So that's my first, but then, then to go back to the more nitty gritty in the environment sector um, and the framework, we've got to have accountability measures built into the framework. I know member states are talking about it. And these have to be feasible measures that people can you know, respond to, that's evidence, that's science, but also we match it with the capacity building needed to actually inform those accountability measures. Um, if it's not explicit, those accountability measures and frameworks are simply aspirational. That's my opinion. Brilliant. Thank you, Doreen. Jimin? Thank you. Uh, I think uh, international collaboration uh, is very important for uh, uh, biodiversity conservation uh, because uh, we are living in a, a world uh, now well connected and uh, uh, we need to uh, work together to reduce uh, climate change and the habitat destructions and the disease control. So, uh, so I will have uh, highlight the significance uh, international collaborations. Uh, we have uh, some very good mechanism for WHO, for the o, uh, OIE, and uh, we really need uh, in international coordinations uh, on wildlife uh, diseases uh, monitoring 
and uh, controls. I think uh, in the future, uh, there really uh, need to strengthen uh, these kind of uh, collaborations. Thank you. Thank you, Jivin. So really a lot of richness in those responses, you know, a call for strengthening international collaboration, for strengthening accountability and monitoring and reporting, as uh, Doreen and uh, Jivin both implied, also uh, strengthening essentially what is the operationalization and the implementation of what is a One Health approach across the different sectors, both nationally and internationally, mobilizing youth and making sure that uh, uh, science is translational. So I think there's a lot of rich elements there, Paula. I don't know if this has uh, responded to your question or if there's anything you may wish to add as well to this eloquent response. Oh, yeah, as you did, but I think one big point too is we need to try to fight fake news. We have a lot of fake news here, including coming from who, like, oh, who said that? Who? So uh, we need to find some, some way to fight that and vinculate the right, the right news. So I, I really don't know how to do it, but I think this is one point to be added to this to this list brilliant point yes absolutely there has been an absolute upsurge in the infodemic right as we've so called it with the advent of covid-19 and i think that that is you know uh everyone's role here today as scientists that's precisely uh, what we need to be doing. Uh, we need to make that science clear, but we also need to make it understandable. And that goes back to the translational dimension of science. If we, if we transmit these messages and this narrative in a way that policymakers can't necessarily understand or that doesn't appeal to them and that doesn't appeal across sectors, as Doreen was mentioning, that makes it very difficult to then uh, to combat that, that infodemic. Um, opening up for other questions that other co-panelists may have. And if not, then that would be perfect timing as we do have quite a few questions from, from, some, of, uh, from some of the participants. And again, I'm just reminding participants that you can include those questions in the, uh, the Q&A uh, screen on the very bottom. So I'm gonna start with the first one. Um, which is open to all of you. At the international level, is there an agency to develop a guideline to guide research and decision making on climate, biodiversity, and public health at the national level? Um, and also, is there an international scientific pro program uh, to promote this work? So, um, yes, opening it up to you, maybe starting with um, Lily. I saw your microphone was off, so I didn't mean to put you on the spot. Oh. <laughs> I, thought, I, thought, I thought you were I You did. <laughs> I, I'm reading some of the questions here, and I think that uh, it is very important to make a comment on the participation of the private sector. We always talk about government, we always talk, talk, talk about indigenous people and local uh, communities, but we rarely speak about the private sector because they have a, a, a huge impact. Um, they also uh, have a big collaboration with government and we need to find a way uh, how trade and uh, the private sector um, unify on contributing to sustainable development and taking into account some of these key issues like, uh, like health. I think we are in a moment um, with a huge opportunity to bring efforts together and put them on the spot, not to criminalize them, but to, to put them on our side. 
Thank you, Lily. It was great that I put you on the spot in the end because you see you <laughs> went into the chat and already began to address uh, one of the questions from another one of the participants who had who had said, well, what about the private sector? You know, what do we need to do to engage them? So maybe before going back to the first question that we originally posed, you um, you got the ball rolling on on the on the role of the private sector and the need to meaningfully engage with the private sector because of course it takes everyone but um then i to play devil's advocate you know how what what are the safeguards and mechanisms to ensure that uh that 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 the engagement from the private sector isn't uh, simple greenwashing, for instance. Um, so just playing devil's advocate there and opening that up to panelists. I don't know, maybe uh, the stamps, the green stamps, so add value to what they sell, if they respect and include this in the environmental law, they need to, to uh, I don't know if they respect, they, they should respect, but if they, they need to do an, an, an environmental assessment or something like that, they, they need to fill up all these, these targets. And if they do more, they, I don't know, they, they have some bonus, they, an additional stamp. I, I think this and um, green marketing too, where people can choose if they want to buy like a meat from a play, uh, a meat that comes from uh, an area that is free from uh, deforestation, this aggregate value, some, something like that. I think it's a one way to, to think about that. Brilliant. Does anybody else want to jump in on that, Jivin or Doreen? I'll jump in really quickly. I mean, there's a couple of precedents out there that we can already, taking the safeguard question, I'm a big fan of carrots and sticks, first of all. You're not gonna, complex issues that cut across sectors, you cannot regulate yourself out of them. Um, and so, but you need it, but you need really good regulation. So to me, there are safeguards, concepts of polluter pays, these things have been around forever. A lot of these issues around pollution and doing harm to nature is what's driving up health risks, right? So we've got to calculate that and we've got to build that in. And we don't just build it in the environment sector, we build it in the health sector, we build it in the develop, we build it in the finance sector, right? That's that's how we get at that. But at the same time, let's take advantage of again, I go back to the opportunity that COVID is presenting us. If there is an opportunity, there's there is an awakening. And there's a lot of kind of hand waving, we've got to do something, but what do we do about it? But the next step is how do we get together? And this goes back to Dr. Zeng's comment about collaboration and multilateral. You know, we've got to work together and we've got to frame these issues together. We've got to understand them. And that's where the concept of kind of, again, I'll push my systems thinking, but also this concept of really getting at co-benefits. You know, if we start to do things differently in the different sectors, let's articulate those co-benefits. By doing this, I'm solving this problem. Um, I think, and then my last point I'll make is there is no shortage of national, regional, sub-national, sub-regional, and global frameworks that we already have. But are we using them effectively? And are we using them together? You know, I'm not saying there may not be a need for other things, but we've got the opportunity. We have three Rio conventions coming up, the world, all of us, three Rio conventions this year coming up. You know, these are really important. How do we make sure that they reinforce each other, that their targets set in one are amplifying targets set in another, and we're actually calculating those potential benefits? Um, I think that's a real opportunity right now. Um, and we've got, you know, these COPs are scheduled for less than six months away. So now's the time to engage with governments, engage with civil society, and do more, all of us, and bring all this scientific voice to bear to make those connections and collaborations happen. Uh, yes. Because the climate change and biodiversity and the public health are very, uh, three important components. And I think they're really a need. Uh, uh, at an international level, there are some mechanisms to 
to promote their collaboration or coordinations, I think, because it, uh, there are really clear evidence that the three components interact with each other. So uh, th th this is my uh, suggestion. Um, for biodiversity, I, I think uh, uh, biodiversity really have some links with uh, zoonotic diseases, but uh, because biodiversity is big enough, and I think he, he, sh he should focus on his goals. Uh, you know, uh, past uh, during past uh, ten years, and uh, uh, many uh, objects uh, were not uh, realized uh, because we cannot so uh, uh, broad the goals. So we can focus on the collaborations between uh, the three components, but uh, biodiversity should be much more focused on its goals for redu reducing the habitat losses and uh, the species extinctions. Uh, I think this is my uh, ideas on this. Thank you so much. Thank you so much to all of the panelists, actually. Such critically important points raised on the need for cross-sectoral uh, collaboration, for the implementation of safeguards, for getting to the co-benefits, uh, like you uh, were mentioning, Doreen. Um, the the idea of green stamps and certification, as you were, were noting, uh, uh, Paola, and also potentially green marketing. And I think this actually comes, this, this actually brings us back to, to a couple of the questions that I see here in the chat. One of the questions that Doreen was posing was, you know, how do we uh, uh, make sure that the Rio conventions reinforce each other? Um, that is a very important question. If this, I mean, this year we, we're going to be looking at the COP15, we're going to be looking at the, we're going to have the COP26, we're going to, so there are a lot of, of, um, of different international forums that are in a way competing for attention, even though they are seeking to address many common challenges. So really, how do we get to those co-benefits? And also, how do we uh, meaningfully address those co-harms, if you will? So I think that touches a little bit uh, on the first question that was posted here in the chat, but uh, beyond just the environmental sector. So it's one thing to say, well, this is what we can do to align the narrative across the three different Rio conventions, but what is it that we can do to meaningfully and compellingly align that narrative, bringing in uh, different sectors as well. I think that is, is you know, speaks to that first question uh, that we were looking at. Is there an agency to develop guidelines to guide some of that research, but then to also drive policy? How do we ensure that that happens? Anybody can just jump in uh, as you as you like. I think that that that's important food for thought. And you know, we. This isn't the be all end all. I realize that we have exactly four minutes left, so there's not going to be much time to elaborate on these questions, but it certainly is critically important food for thought as we're looking, for instance, at that post 2020 global biodiversity framework, as we're looking at those targets and those indicators, these are some questions that can be um, at the back of our minds. Um, in, in, in that analysis. And I see that Lily also has something to add. Thank you, Lily, please jump in. You know, I don't think we have an agency, uh, you an agency that was taking that uh, role on the science, on organizing the science. That was one of the, that is one of the objectives of the science forum, at least to gather together and get some ideas to put uh, like a general agenda for research to go together with the global biodiversity framework or what the CBD is discussing. That's more or less one of the um, outputs we would like to have. And uh, this is not official, but um, we had one meeting in 2014 also with climate change, with the COP on climate change. 
So I think that we can see in the future, this is not a formal thing, but it's one way to unify the three conventions. Uh, thank you. Brilliant point, Lily. Thank you for bringing us back to today. The reason we are all gathered here in session four, actually, uh, that's 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 absolutely brilliant. Yes, the science forum is definitely one of the mechanisms uh, that that can help to uh, develop guidelines to guide research. Thank you for reminding us that one of the outcomes of this session today will be to have the outcome document that brings together the important views that we're expressed by each of the panelists here uh, among us. Uh, so we are looking forward to sharing that uh, summary with you and also looking forward to your further inputs um, and questions moving forward. And maybe, you know, I, I realize that we have very little time left and that we soon have to close the Q&A session. But because we've addressed the private sector, because we've addressed the international and the global level, I do want to go back to one of the questions that one of the participants has brought here and bring it back down to the ground. I think several of our speakers today have talked about, you know, the role and the importance of traditional knowledge of Indigenous peoples and really um, these uh, these these populations are really are at the forefront of natural resource management and determine um, how we can sustainably manage and and use biodiversity and have been doing so uh, far more wisely uh, than than uh, than others for for millennia actually. So I would like to bring it back to that question because there was a question about well you know we're talking about developing evidence-based policy we're talking about evidence-based uh, uh, policy prescriptions and solutions and we're talking about cross-sectoral reality and we're talking about interdisciplinarity but how do we ensure that evidence-based policy also takes into account the valuable knowledge that has been trans transmitted from generation to generation by, um, by Indigenous people? How do we also ensure that it is an inclusive dialogue and approach? Again, leaving that open uh, to anybody who would like well, to jump in. I'll, I'll jump in really quickly. I mean, first of all, let's determine what is science, right? Science is the uh, understanding of our world around us through observation, experimentation, learning lessons, things like that. Indigenous people, because I'm, I'm answering the question, they do it every day. We do it every day. So I do think the not only the role of Indigenous people, but you know, the active movement on citizen science in informing how we at least collect data and understand our world is absolutely critical. We know we have big gaps. So I think that's an exciting space. But yeah, I think part of it is also how do we set up the dialogue? I mean, the how do we set up the dialogue in a way where um, important voices that are not used to speaking in Zoom, which are not used to, you know, standing on a podium are given that space and that we as active listeners are listening for that different way that people communicate their values. Um, and so I think there's a lot of that in a lot of the convention creating space for it, but could, there could be a lot more. And I think um, it's important to actually dedicate resources and time to creating that space in an active way. And then, um, and, and time is short, but we need to do more of it. Yes, excellent point, Doreen. Um, so part of that is about building capacity around what we know and what we don't know. And part of building that capacity, as you say, is really revolves around active listening. So um, <laughs> learning from uh, each other. It's a, it's, 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 and it's what we're all doing here today and what we hope to do uh, long past this session. I believe that um, my co-chair Niels will soon be telling me that uh, our time has run out. So to preempt that, <laughs> um, I, I, I would like to encourage all of you 
uh, to keep asking your questions. As we said, this forum is going to be, re you know, all of the questions that have been unanswered are going to be reposted on this forum. There is going to be opportunity to continue engaging over the next three days. So please, uh, three business days, which us, I believe, to the 27th of April. Um, and so, um, and so please do continue to be engaged. And of course, beyond that, beyond the questions, beyond the discussion points that were raised here, there's going to be the outcome report and there's going to be engagement in the post-2020 global biodiversity framework in uh, the COP15, in the uh, COP26 and, and all of the various international venues, the sustainable development goals that bring us together. So that will be all from me for now. And bringing it back over to you, Niels. Thank you to all our panelists uh, for incredibly rich discussions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christina, and thank you very much, everybody. This has indeed been very uh, enlightening and enriching, uh, as you say. I will make um, three points in addition to introducing the next session, linking to what has been said, fake news, Fake facts is a problem. Internet is a wonderful thing, but it's also a threat to solid knowledge. And what can we do? We, scientists, we have to stand up. We have to communicate. We have to make sure that decision makers know that we know what we are talking about and that fake facts is fake. We have to do that job. Because unfortunately, decision makers do listen to fake news or fake facts. We have to stand up for our values. Furthermore, there has to be cooperation and interaction between the different sectors, be it the private sector, others it has been mentioned, and also between the different dis disciplines. Interaction is very important. The way scientists operate today, and indeed the way many of us operate today, is very sectorial. We don't read each other papers. We don't read each other's books. We don't go to the same conferences. And if we do go to the same conference, we go to different sessions. We need to interact much more. The third point, there has to be, and also being mentioned, there has to be more international collaboration on climate change, on biodiversity loss, on disease threats, pandemics. What we see today in connection with COVID-19 is a crazy way of dealing with this. Each country do their things and each part of the country do their things. It is, a, as a scientist, it's a fantastic experiment because you get data that way, but it's a totally immoral experiment. If I, as a scientist, had asked for permission, ethical permission, they would have put me in, 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 into jail because I, they would have seen me as a crazy person. Now the politician is doing that experiment, it's crazy. There has to be international collaboration. So then I'm supposed to introduce the next session. The next session is young scholars and a professional uh, session, ecological restoration, uh, framing challenge of opportunities. Young scholars. I'm an old established scientist. I hate young people, but I also love young people. I love them at the same time as I hate them because they challenge me. They say that what I have been saying all along might have been wrong. Well, sometimes what I have been saying all along is actually right. But sometimes they are right and I'm wrong. We better listen to young people. Thank you very much, everybody.